morning, everyone, and thank you for uh, coming this morning to realize how much I don't know. Absolutely. Well, um, as I've been putting, I've been talking to folks about teaching this specific class for the last few weeks. Um, in case anyone had any golden nuggets that I need to be sure to include. Uh, unfortunately, most people said, I'll just watch it after the fact and learn from what you teach. Um, so we'll see uh, how this goes together. Um, I think that's a, a great way for us to start this morning is a reminder that I am not here to class because I am an expert, um, or that I have all of this uh, concept of relationships and reconciliation. Um, but I do think it's important to, to model the concept of learning with one another, right? A lot of, um, hopefully a lot of the messages you've been hearing this fall as we've been in this truth and reconciliation theme um, is that we don't have to be perfect. <laughs> we don't have to have it all together. Um, but the more that we can seek truth and the more that we can seek out one another, I think the stronger we'll be. Um, so that's my plan this morning is to, to talk about some tools that we have in our toolbox as people, um, as well as specifically as Christians, uh, that I think that we can do relationships just a little bit better. Um, we can have a little bit more grace and a little bit more love. Um, and I think the rest hopefully works itself out with that. <laughs> um, so my approach to this is uh, similar to how I approach issues and relationships that I've had in my life as well. Um, kind of break it down a little bit, right? If we take the whole issue with everyone we've ever had an issue with, that is way too big <laughs> to take care of, especially in one foul swoop. Um, so I like to break things down, as many of you probably learned by now. Um, and this is where the truth-telling piece comes into play for us. Um, we have to share our truth, and we have to genuinely listen. That's right, genuinely listen um, to uh, other people's truth as well. Sometimes that's painful. Um, sometimes we are um, the problem in, in the situation whether we meant to or not. Um, and other times we have to give the person who's the problem for us a moment to share their truth as well. Um, and so this is not easy work, uh, but again, I think is possible work, which is something rightly needed in our world today. Um, so there are a couple things that I think uh, either get in our way significantly or um, that greatly can help us in the process of navigating relationships, trying to figure out life, even just with one other person, can be complicated sometimes. You don't have to point fingers in this room, especially for our married couples who are here. Um, <laughs> uh, but it can be really tricky. Um, and throughout this morning, I have three different videos for us today, again, because I am not an expert here. Um, but we're going to hear from Dr. Brene Brown. Have, have folks in the room heard of her before? Um, so she is um, a psychology and sociology professor at UT Austin, I believe, um, and does a lot of research around um, relationships. Uh, in that is involved in vulnerability, shame, blame um, and she does great research she's also just a very approachable professor um, in all of the videos that I have watched so we're going to learn from her a bit this morning um, and the first video I have is something that I think really gets in the way as we seek reconciliation with one another um, and that is blame I know none of you have ever blamed anyone else for anything, especially something that was your own fault. Uh, but just imagine for a moment what it's like to blame. Um, there is a brief curse word at the beginning of this video, but it's too good not to show. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, I, I don't want to offend folks this morning, but also you can handle it. You can handle it. Yeah, that's good. Right. <laughs> so this is um, our key number one of today. Uh, we're talking about blame. Make sure I share screen and sound. 
great. This little thing always gets in my way too. Here we go. All right. How many of you are blamers? How many of you, when something goes wrong, the first thing you want to know is whose fault it is? Hi, my name is Brene. I am a blamer. <laughs> Let me just tell you this quick story. So this is a couple of years ago when I first realized the magnitude to which I blame. I'm in my house. I have on white slacks and a pink sweater set, and I'm drinking a cup of coffee in my kitchen. It's a full cup of coffee. I drop it on the tile floor. It goes into a million pieces, splashes up all over me. And the first, I mean, a millisecond after it hit the floor, right out of my mouth is this, damn you, Steve. <laughs> Who is my husband? Because let me tell you how fast this works for me. So Steve plays water polo with a group of friends. And the night before, he went to go play water polo. And I said, hey, make sure you come back at 10, because you know, I can never fall asleep into your home. And he got back like at 10.30. And so I went to bed a little bit later than I thought. Ergo, my second cup of coffee that I probably would not be having had he come home when we discussed. Therefore, and so the rest of that story is I'm cleaning up um, the kitchen. Steve calls, caller ID. I'm like, hey. He's like, hey, what's going on, babe? <laughs> what's going on? Um, <laughs> So I'll tell you exactly what's going on. <laughs> I'm cleaning up the coffee that spilled all, do like dial tone. Because <laughs> he knows. How many of you go to that place when something bad happens, the first thing you want to know is whose fault is it? No. I'd rather it be my fault than no one's fault. Because why, why? Because it gives us some semblance of control. But here, if you enjoy blaming, this is where you should stick your fingers in your ear and do the na 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 thing because I'm getting ready to ruin it for you. Because here's what we know from the research. Blame is simply the discharging of discomfort and pain. It has an inverse relationship with accountability. Accountability by definition is a vulnerable process. It means me calling you and saying, hey, my feelings were really hurt about this and talking. It's not blaming. Blaming is simply a way that we discharge anger. People who blame a lot seldom have the tenacity and grit to actually hold people accountable because we expend all of our energy raging for 15 seconds and figuring out whose fault something is. And blaming is very corrosive in relationships and it's one of the reasons we miss our opportunities for empathy. Because when something happens and we're hearing a story, we're not really listening we're in the place where I was making the connections as quickly as we can about whose fault something was. Right, pretty, pretty wonderful uh, teacher here to say the least. <laughs> and uh, based on the chapels in the room, I'm gonna guess that maybe you have some uh, similar experiences. Dr. Brown. As my neighbor was saying, it's hard to do when you live alone. Okay. That is funny. And even then, we'll find something, we'll, we can find something to blame, right? The dog or the cat or um, yourself, right? I, I love how Renee pointed out, I would rather blame myself than no one at all. Because it's this concept of how we're trying to seek control. And there are so many things in our life over which we do not have control. And if we're honest, there are probably zero situations where we actually have control, but there are times where we feel like it. And we love those times. And we love those times. You're right, Marianne, absolutely. Um, and this, I think it's really important, I just wanted to highlight some of the, the reasons I wanted to show this video for us this morning. We want some semblance of control because this is a way that we can discharge our discomfort and our pain, which a little hint here is why truth is so important in this concept of truth and reconciliation. If we can find healthier ways to express our pain and our discomfort in relationships without having to blame others or blame ourselves, 
perhaps we have a chance to actually see real reconciliation and not, uh, you know, damn you, Steve, right <laughs> off the bat. Um, another important piece here is that blame has an inverse relationship with accountability. Um, it's easy, especially with the fun cartoons and her jovial nature, um, to to kind of just think that she's talking out of um, her personal experiences. But this is also rooted in her actual academic research, um, that blame has an inverse relationship with accountability. And when we're considering what healthy, beneficial relationships look like, we have to have some accountability for one another. Otherwise, I can truthfully tell you, you hurt my feelings in this way, and it doesn't matter because you're not accountable to how I feel um, or to the love we might have in the relationship. So these are some really important uh, pieces. So if we're not going to blame one another or uh, ourselves, what do we do next? Yeah. Is this uh, just open season and you can do whatever you want or you can do nothing and it doesn't matter? Uh, if we're relying on, if we're not relying on blame, what else can we use to help us navigate these situations where at least one person is hurt? Though I would offer that often it is more than one person who is hurt mm -hmm. in situations where reconciliation is needed. So this is where our key instinct number two comes in, something that is helpful for us as we navigate relationships um, is boundaries. And maybe you like me and you were taught growing up that boundaries are bad. If we genuinely love one another, or as we'll hear in our scripture text uh, for this morning, we love God and love one another wholeheartedly, unabashedly, in a steadfast way, just like God loves us, then we can't have boundaries, right? There should be no limitation to the love that we're sharing. Um, but we're going to watch another Brene Brown video here for a moment to consider that perhaps boundaries are necessary in order for us to be healthy and to engage with ourselves, even let alone with other people. Yes. Yeah. Talk about that this morning. That's right. I, I heard that one, Sharon. Oh, yeah, yeah, so we're going to watch uh, video number two here. Especially when I remember to share the screen so our friends on Zoom can see it as well. Sharing sound. Yeah. Let that little buddy go away. I can't believe you heard me say that. No. Oh, well, that's why you hire the cool young pastor, right? <laughs> that is very good. <laughs> <laughs> One of the most shocking findings of my work was the idea that the most compassionate people I have interviewed over the last 13 years were also the absolutely most boundaried. Because most boundary. they, so I'll give you a great definition of the, the, the definition of boundary that I use in the book. Boundary is simply what's okay and what's not okay. What I think we do is we don't set boundaries. We let people do things that are not okay or get away with behaviors that are not okay. Then we're just resentful and hateful. Me, I'd rather be loving and generous and very straightforward with what's okay and what's not okay. Um, and I did not, I, that I learned from the research. I was the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. I, I assumed for the first 35 years of my life that people were sucking on purpose just to piss me off. Mm -hmm. That's what I assumed. Um, that, yeah, right. Whether it was someone who worked for me or it was someone who, family member who was constantly like, I was always critical and judgy. And I was like, why are they choosing these things? Why are they making their choices? They should know better. And then when this thing came up from my therapist, what if people are doing the best they can? I thought, my husband had the most beautiful answer to that question. He said, I'll never know whether people are doing the best they can or not. But when I assume people are, it makes my life better. 
So now I think I am not as sweet as I used to be, but I'm far more loving. It's not just some like technique so that you can do that. That's really like a way of being to like nurture that soil of wholeheartedness. Yeah. Generosity to assume the best about people is almost an inherently selfish act because the life you change first is your own. You love yourself. Right? Yeah. yeah. And so it's, so my question is big, B-I-G. Mm -hmm. What boundaries need to be in place mm -hmm. for me to stay in my integrity and make the most generous assumptions about you? But generosity can't exist without boundaries and we are not comfortable setting boundaries because we care more about what people will think and we don't want to disappoint anyone we want everyone to like us and boundaries are not easy um but i think they're the key to self-love and i think they're the key to treating others with loving kindness sustaining sustaining you can't nothing is sustainable without boundaries i think compassion and empathy are different things and again i'm relying on my data for this i think compassion is a deeply held belief that we're inextricably connected to each other by something rooted in love and goodness. I call that God. Not everybody calls that God. Um, my dad would call it fishing. Um, fishing? Fishing? Is it fishing? No, there's no G in fishing. Okay. Um, but I think it, compassion is a deeply held belief. I think empathy is the skill set to bring compassion alive. So empathy is something we can teach. I mean, it's something we've taught our kids since they were very little. It's about how to communicate that deep love for people in a way so that people don't know they're not alone. I think there's a lot of new and inf interesting information out there about empathy not being a good thing, about that, you know, this, there's an argument that says, you know, if Travis is in struggle and I practice empathy with you, I'm taking on your darkness and it leads to burnout and it leads to, but empathy is not feeling for somebody. It's feeling with them. It's touching a place in me that knows where you've been. So I can look at you and say, me too, brother, you're not alone in this. Um, and I find empathy to be infinite. I think it gives back tenfold what you put out. It's sustaining. Like if, it's you, sustaining. if you've done the work and uh, you have your boundaries, mm -hmm. I mean, you could tread that water forever and never get tired. Okay, so empathy. I'm quoting Travis here, empathy. If you've done your work and set your boundaries, you can tread that water forever. Yes. Amen. It's not finite and it keeps giving back to us. And so this idea that, but, but here we go back to where we started this conversation. Empathy minus boundaries is not empathy. Compassion minus boundaries is not genuine. Vulnerability without boundaries is not vulnerability. So you see that there's a right. huge riff here, which is boundaries are freaking important. Right. And it's not, they're not fake walls. They're not separation. Boundaries are not division. They're respect. There's here's what's okay for me and here's what's not. So uh, how, how do we feel with that uh, proposal here? That boundaries are a good thing, that boundaries actually allow us to be more compassionate and more vulnerable. Um, the boundaries are respect. How are, we, how are we feeling in the room here? Well, let me build on Sharon Swisper. But, uh, <laughs> I think to broaden it, anytime we're dealing with people uh, that are in some way need needing something. I think that uh, there's a tendency to fill the need without considering uh, a boundary and considering what responsibility they should have versus the responsibility that we have to resolve the situation.
-hmm. So, for example, uh, one of our partners is is too low on gas to go to where she wants to go. Needs to have some gas brought. Actually, two of our partners had the same situation. I think maybe they uh, caught the clue from each other. Um, so I think there's an opportunity to um, fill that need and yet maybe have a conversation about anticipating uh, the need for gas. Yeah. And I think that maybe does a little bit of empathy and a little bit of boundary. Absolutely. And I think it's it's easier for me to imagine boundaries with tangible things like gas <laughs> than it is for you need me to show up in a way that I cannot. Um, you know, I think part of why I struggle sometimes in relationships and this concept of seeking reconciliation is that it's all intangible. <laughs> mm -hmm. You need me to love you in a way that I don't know how or I don't have capacity to love you. You need me to show up for you in a way that I don't understand yet. Um, and those things can change and alter over time or there are moments when we do have capacity. Um, but if we're not constantly checking in with ourselves, and checking in with one another on, as Brene Brown says, what's okay and what's not okay, um, then we are way likely to experience um, the things that we're told come with boundaries, like burnout um, and you know being the only giver in the relationship, those kinds of things. Mary. Yeah, and that's I like to hear that um, we, we get the training about boundaries for pastors. Yes, and it's more about. They're the other person's boundary, and and uh, and recognizing and not crossing their boundary out of our need, um, which is the training that we have. We're supposed to have every three years, but we might not. <laughs> Actually, I used to teach it, so I don't feel too guilty. <laughs> but it's it's uh, it's a, co a concept that that many who are in service to others don't realize that the other. They, <clears throat> not only do, are they not setting their own boundaries, but they're not honoring anybody else's. Mm -hmm. And um, and and those, it's my need. You you want to feel my need, whether you know. <clears throat> but I think I'm helping you. Right. And um, it, it's a serious thing, and it's in the in the role in any kind of. Uh, role where there is uh, responsibility for the well-being of the other, a counselor, a doctor, uh, an attorney, pastor, anybody. It's very easy to get into that field because you feel want to feel needed, and so then you take care of other people in order to feel needed, and the whole time you're using the other person and setting. Do you have no boundary in the other person? isn't allowed to have boundaries yeah. and that that's to me is, is where I learned it but I'm interested in also it's about one's own I like the, the point of view uh, uh, a different looking at it from a different aspect uh, yeah. but empathy is only as good as how much energy you've got mm -hmm. But it isn't, it isn't an endless thing. It isn't yeah. an endless thing. That's right. And if we have boundaries, perhaps we can do it for long enough to self care. Yeah. Empathy, empathy can, and and I think of uh, emergency workers and fire, uh, fire personnel, and any kind of people who are in constant situation. For instance, the, the uh, police that have had to be taken care of, and no doubt the hospitals and everybody else in Maine. Mm -hmm. the empathy that is required for how many families um, there's only so much that those uh, give those uh, personnel that are doing the work of caring can manage and if they don't have their own boundaries they will burn out mm -hmm. you know what happens with burnout you get angry a lot of anger. That's and right. It's your fault that I'm angry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And it circles right back to blame, right? These things are so connected to one another and they all impact how we're in relationship with one another. Even if we love that person more than anything in the whole world, if we don't have boundaries, we can't figure it out. I'm interested in that. I'm, I'm thinking, you know, I'm wondering what boundaries I believe. In, in relationship, let's say, to marriage, my wife. 
something to think about. But I don't I, I don't even know what ones I have yeah, or which ones I might exercise at times. Absolutely. And they're gonna change too, right? So for the for the most part, for a um an easy example here, um Katie and I have very distinct roles in our household, um, not because that's a structured thing, but just because of the gifts we have and the capacities we have. I am terrible in the kitchen. I get very stressed. I get very angry. <laughs> um, it never turns out well for me. And so in our household, Katie is the one who does the cooking. She does the meal prep and the grocery shopping. Those things are so stressful to me. And I will take care of other things. I will do the dishes before and after she is uh, cooked. I will do the laundry, those kinds of things. Um, and that's kind of the boundaries we have because I am not gonna be a good wife if I end up having to cook dinner at a time when I don't have capacity to do something that's outside of my normal skill set. <laughs> but every once in a while, <laughs> I have a little bit of extra capacity and I can move that boundary and say, you know what? You had a heck of a week at work and it's Saturday morning, our one actual mutual day off together. How about I cook breakfast this morning? I can open the can of cinnamon rolls and put some eggs in a frying pan. Um, that can be a, a moved boundary for this morning, knowing that I will wake up today and not be able to cook for breakfast because I need to get to work um, to make sure that the computer is functioning so we can have this class together, <laughs> right? And so it's, it's a constant communication with the small things, but also the big things, right? So whose family are we gonna spend Thanksgiving with? Uh, who do we have capacity to spend things <laughs> yeah, right. um, You know, and those those are constant things. And in healthy relationships, it doesn't always have to be a constant sit down, let us write out our boundaries in blood so that it is here forever. Um, but instead, it's probably already a part of your normal conversations, right? Your decision, to, if you had capacity to come to the movie last weekend, Right, you all had flooding in your apartment, all of these things going on. Do we have capacity? Mm -hmm. um, you know, is this okay or is this not okay? And even if you would have texted me as the movie started to say something came up and we can't make it, great, <laughs> right? And so it's about seeing one another and allowing for that space, what you have capacity for um, as that changes or the things that really don't change like most of the time my capacity in the kitchen. Yeah. Fancy. Um, I was just thinking early on when my husband and I started our business together, mm -hmm. then um, we worked with a counselor to help set boundaries on how we would navigate having a business, mm -hmm. what we would do at home, and um, you know, and also the fact that we had a brand new baby at the same time. <laughs> so all those things going on. We had a what? A new baby at the same oh, time. Okay. So it was really helpful because we came up with some things that I would call non-negotiables, but that you didn't have to do all the time, but you would ask before you could, you know, do different things. And one of them was we were not going to talk about work at home. Mm -hmm. And um, we would create a physical boundary actually and so we would meet outside of our house mm -hmm. to talk about this little fledgling business that was starting out and everything <laughs> um so that we could keep that in that context mm -hmm. and then have mm -hmm. our home be our home mm -hmm. because it was kind of all consuming but at least you could walk in the door of your house and it didn't consume that part mm -hmm. of your life so. absolutely yeah, i think that would be more of an issue with what you told me to do but i just have to the boundaries where you just yeah. been in the office, but now you're doing it all at home. Absolutely. And studies even show for folks who do work in their bedroom, they have a harder time and less quality of sleep because they can't they can't differentiate that space in their minds. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah. I was going to say, when you talk about boundaries, too, you have boundaries with your children, right? Mm -hmm. you, you just don't, uh, uh, it's not just a free-for-all of you know, it, even when you think about your adult children, you have to figure out what your boundaries are and what their boundaries are. You know, you can't just like, I think I have an example of my sister whose mother-in-law, they gave her a key, right, to the house. Oh, yeah. 
Well, I think they thought that was okay at first, except for she uh, decided she'd just show up whenever she wanted to. So guess what? The key, she doesn't have a key anymore. Mm -hmm. We're her mother in law. So. And we're taught, or at least I was, uh, maybe this is a Southern culture thing or a Christian thing or something. We're taught that that's bad, right? That if we take something away from someone, if we are removing access, um, that we are the bad person in that situation. But I'm imagining that that relationship is so much better and will last for so much longer Probably. in a healthier way yeah. because mom doesn't have a key. Um, and that's the piece with boundaries that I think we have to continue to learn. Um, it might tell us that it's not right in our brain, um, but in fact, it is good for the longevity of this relationship we're trying to have. Well, yeah, that's kind of how I think of my family lives in the Tri Cities. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I do feel guilty sometimes, but I realize that my boundary is is I can't go there all the time, you know, because it doesn't do me. It, and it's not like it, and that's another boundary. You have to figure out what you're causing too, mm -hmm. right? At yeah. first, you think it's all because well, it, there's where the blame comes in, and then I started to realize. That you know, I have to curve whatever I'm doing too, if I want to get along with my family. So that's Absolutely. right. You have to listen to them. Yeah. What What's interesting is that your sense of, well, with my five kids, the boundary issue is completely different with each one. Mm -hmm. Yes, which yeah. throws me periodically <laughs> because I think I'm talking to that daughter. No, it's that daughter who mm -hmm. has way higher boundaries than this daughter uh, about different certain kinds of things <clears throat> and that that's that still you know it's come on guys just just be the same don't make me do that <laughs> i don't want to have to do different just because you're different you know well, they're all okay. different individuals are you okay. getting, you're telling me <laughs> <laughs> right yeah yeah this, uh, you you know, I'm, I'm nervous about this because I'm talking about marriage in my relationship without her being there. <laughs> we have a condo and we have this extra room. There are no windows in it, but it's carpeted and it's, you know, so we put a bed in there, a queen size bed. Now, my daughter who lives in um, the Bay Area and my son who lives in Portland, they're really concerned, particularly about their father who is at, um, you know, a, recovery, a retirement community, but he's had serious health issues and he's clearly, you know, on the decline. And so they're hovering. They want to come. I heard them say, I heard one of them say by mistake, we've decided that one month Jim will come, one month Katie will come, because their parents need, you know, a little attention. And so because we have this guest room, and we've been, you know, oh, you can stay here. And it is particularly hard sometimes on a relationship because Mary doesn't have bandwidth for having that many people around every time she turns around. Yeah. And truth to tell, she was gone one weekend and I had Jim and Joan a, and it was, you know, exhausting for me because every time they weren't there, they were, you know, let's talk, you know. It, and so that's a boundary that she and I need to talk about. And maybe do some hard work with our kids on. Absolutely. But just because we have a bed doesn't mean that it's open season. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah. yeah. And again, you can share your truth and your understanding of the situation yeah. um, so that they can understand it better rather than just saying, sorry, the guest bed is off limits. <laughs> right? Well, yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm just sitting here realizing that I have paid, I have not honored that the strong introvert that Mary is mm -hmm. in this, in my wish to be, you know, a generous grandmother. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, and that's where I, I find hope. Um, the, the, my favorite line, I guess, from this last video um, is that empathy is the skill set to keep our compassion alive. Mm -hmm. And it's something that can be taught. Mm -hmm. Can it always? It seems to me there are some people who just do not have a capacity to feel with someone else. It's feel empathy. Yeah. There's a spectrum of people. Yeah. That's very true. So, I I like to believe that there there's 
something that can move in there. Um, so for example, all of the rest of Katie's family um, is on the autism spectrum. Mm -hmm. uh, so having fun family conversations about <laughs> big life decisions or even small life decisions mm -hmm. is very complicated um, for folks who literally do not have the connection in their brain to understand where other people are going through or where they're coming from. Um, but it doesn't stop us from sharing our truth and saying, Chris, when you say that, it really hurts our feelings. And it doesn't mean that he's not going to say it the next time. <laughs> but perhaps someone else, you know, Katie's sister or her dad might hear that and be able to understand a little bit more of, well, whatever just happened wasn't okay. And so maybe perhaps I'll check in a little bit more, or maybe perhaps I'll ask questions and try to figure it out a little bit. That doesn't always happen. Um, and so it, it can be very tricky, but I do think there are areas for growth. Um, and especially for those of us who are slightly more neurotypical, um, that doesn't mean that we can't have boundaries and say that's not okay, um, or this is okay. It would mean a lot to us if you also asked how our week was and not just us always ask you how yours is, right? And so we can continue to navigate that. It's a constant push and pull and um, being able to navigate uh, in relationships as well. Nancy, I think before, you know, in between the blame and the boundaries for me, and it makes me think about your water bottle there, it's like there's two steps and one of them is breathe. Mm -hmm. You know, like, so you spill the coffee and the first thing you do is say, Gosh get me up during the night or whatever, you know. <laughs> but, but, you know, you breathe and you just take time to let that really strong amount of energy just kind of sit and then flow through. And then, you know, it seems like the other one is just to be curious because when I have that scene in my kitchen on a day, I used to do exactly that. And I probably still more than likely would do exactly that. But sometimes I'm just curious. And then it makes me think, I've got something going on that actually when I get in my car today, I should be more observant. Mm -hmm. I should, you know, be thinking about something's going on where I just broke a glass and spilled an entire cup of coffee. So it, to me, it's almost like a signal. Maybe I should be on the lookout for other things to be aware of today. It's not going to be just that normal day where you can just be on autopilot or something. Absolutely. Nancy, thank you for that. That is the perfect segue into uh, my last video here. <laughs> um, it wasn't planned. Uh, uh, of the piece that really um, can be the most powerful uh, tool that we have, but also requires the most of us. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit, uh, or Brene Brown will talk for us um, about vulnerability and how challenging that can be. Mm -hmm. We think about vulnerability as a dark emotion. You know, there are a lot of people who talk about light, emo you know, positive emotions, negative emotions, dark emotions, light emotions. We think of vulnerability as a dark emotion. We think of it as the core of fear and shame and grief and disappointment, uncertainty, things that we do not want to feel, right? Things that I don't want to be vulnerable because that means I'm afraid. That means I'm uncertain. That means I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm at risk. I'm exposed. I'm, I'm in grief. So what we do is we armor up and we say, I do not want to slip into these dark emotions. I will not let myself be vulnerable. But here's what I learned from the research and certainly put into motion in my own life that was the most life-changing, is that vulnerability is the center of difficult emotion. 
but it's also the birthplace of every positive emotion that we need in our lives. Love, belonging, joy, empathy. How many of you would agree that we're in a serious empathy deficit in our culture today? Totally, right? No vulnerability, no empathy. In a culture where people are afraid to be vulnerable, you can't have empathy. You know, empathy is not a default response. If you share something with me that's difficult, in order for me to be truly empathic, I have to step into what you're feeling. And that's vulnerable. So there can be no empathy without vulnerability. Um, why do you think, in that example that I used a while ago, daughter comes home and says, you know, tears, no one sat with me at lunch today. They made fun of what I was wearing. So-and-so won't talk to me. They poured my books out of my locker. And the response back is, I told you, I bought you all those cute jeans. Why aren't you wearing those jeans? And pull your hair back. Is that an empathic response? No, it's a shaming response. Could that shaming response be at the, could, could, could a mother who absolutely adores her child respond with that shaming response? Please say yes, don't kid yourself. I mean, come on. If, you've got a, if you're a parent sitting in here, then you sure as hell know the answer to that is yes. Um, but why, why did that happen? What, where was the access to vulnerability? Where was, I mean, where was empathy? You can't access empathy if you're not willing to be vulnerable. So if my daughter comes home and tells that to me, guess what I have to do? I have to reactivate that sweaty palmed seventh grader who lives inside me. And I have to go, oh God, that's so hard. I'm so sorry. That's happened to me. That's happened to me when I was in middle school and it's happened to me last week. Let's talk about it. But you can't get there without vulnerability. You can't fake empathy. Innovation and creativity, born of vulnerability. <laughs> um, this is my favorite part. I talked about this, and I did another TED Talk this year at, in Long Beach. And I told the story that during 2011 and even this year, um, after the big TEDx Houston talk went viral, the, the big calls came from Fortune 500 companies. Oh my God, we loved your TED talk. It was great. Please come talk to all of our senior leaders. And it's like, okay, um, what do you want to talk about? Like, we don't care. Just come and talk to us. Just um, if you could ixnay the shame and vulnerability talk. <laughs> Every single conversation, barring maybe 10%. I said, like, well, what do you mean? Well, we you know, you're, you know, you're funny, you have this great research, I think there's a real fit with what we do. We just, we don't really do, you know, that kind of stuff around here. So you, if you could not mention vulnerability and shame. <laughs> so just for fun, for grins, I would say, okay, so what would you like me to talk about? Yeah, fourth quarter earnings, like, <laughs> freaking don't even balance my checkbook. Um, <laughs> like, I'm not gonna talk about that. So. What do, you, what, do you want, what do you want me to talk about? Well, the big issue, creativity and innovation. Mm. And change, we're going through a lot of change. <laughs> like, okay, so vulnerability is the birthplace of creativity, innovation, change. And the reason that crisis is happening is because you're not talking about vulnerability. Imagine creativity and innovation without vulnerability. I'm asking you, for a work product that has never been made before, that's completely innovative, I need you to be creative, and I need you to present it to a group of people who are gonna, half of them are gonna think it's stupid and not understand it. No vulnerability there. Yeah. <laughs> The biggest challenge of this morning is fitting everything in. Um, but I, I think this is such an important key for us folks. Um, as a person who has to work very hard to be vulnerable, 
um, which maybe is not the most obvious thing to uh, the person in the pews. Um, this is hard. There's a lot of, it feels as if there's a lot at risk. Um, and if that is our framework for relationships, um, if we are scared to be vulnerable, if we are you know, scared to be hurt, um, then we just won't do it or we won't do it well. And so I think this is such um, a key for us here to continue to learn how to love one another well and to um, see one another well, to come alongside one another well. We also have to find those pieces of ourselves that we, we could be a little worried about or the, you know, sweaty palm seventh grader part of ourselves that we desperately want to forget. <laughs> The perfect segment into the need for a few more volunteers for our bridge ministries dinner on uh, November 12th. Uh, opportunity for people to take that step, be a little vulnerable, meeting with people whose communication skills they're not quite comfortable with. Right, yeah, absolutely. It, this um, is part of all of our work here, right? Even when we had our conversations, the, the great class that Lois led as we were changing the bathrooms here in the atrium to all gender. It's vulnerable to say, I was taught I'm going to get raped if I go into an all-gender restroom where there's someone who is a different gender than me in the restroom, right? And that, that's vulnerable because it sounds bad and we want to be inclusive and we want to create spaces for folks. But also think of the work we can do if we can say that out loud in a space where we know other folks care and love about, and care about us and love us as well, right? And, and I, the... Um, even the, the printed slides that we started doing um, in the last month or two here um, was because Heather McClure Coleman was sitting up at the front on Dev Sunday to get pictures of Gavin and the kids and what a beautiful day that was. And she kept realizing that she was standing um, in the parts of the service where we asked folks to stand as able, uh, right in front of Doug Soon <laughs> and the whole Aramaki family who, who tend to sit. Um, and that they couldn't see the slides. Mm -hmm. It is vulnerable to say, I was the reason they couldn't see the slides. Yeah. But rather than holding that back and holding that in, Heather brought it to the Faith Experience Committee and said, we gotta have something to do this. Like, we can figure something out here, I'm sure. What if we just had the slides printed out so that even if you are standing in front of the Air Monkey family, uh, they can still participate and see. It's vulnerable to admit when we're at fault. It's, it's vulnerable to try out empathy and maybe sometimes not be good at it. <laughs> um, but I think, um, just like Brene Brown pointed out, that's where we're also going to experience the birthplace of love and belonging and joy. Um, and so that's, um, that's my challenge for us as we continue to learn how to be in relationship with one another as a community of faith, um, but also in our marriages and our uh, family systems. I am mentally preparing to be with all of my family, immediate and extended uh, here in, in just two weeks when my brother's getting married. Um, and I am practicing already with my counselor boundaries. <laughs> I am practicing not blaming them for where they choose to live or how they choose to live. <laughs> Um, I'm slowly but surely uh, building up my capacity to be vulnerable and to be with family members that maybe don't agree with me on some large things in life. But I care so much about the relationship. Um, I care about the opportunity that my brother was vulnerable and invited all these people to be there for his wedding too. And I'm sure many of us have been at weddings where that is a vulnerable experience. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, but it's because we care about one another and we want to continue to learn how to do that uh, well. How would you define vulnerability? Oh, goodness. Um, I'm sure Brene Brown has a better uh, definition than whatever I'm about to come up with. Um, I think vulnerability is uh, an open sharing of ourselves. Sharing. Share. The most vulnerable things of fear and worry and you know, mm -hmm. you know, you're not perfect, you know, absolutely. And unless you're trying to act perfect because you think somebody's not going to love you. 
if you want perfect, right? If you don't know the right thing. It reminds me of the of uh, what Jesus said is that love God and what we do say and love others as you love yourself. Mm -hmm. If you don't have the ego strength and the love and the sense of own, one's own worth, all that's hard. Very, very, and probably not possible. And I got to arrange things for yes. me. Thank <laughs> yeah. you. Absolutely. That's <laughs> such a good connection. Huh? Of so I, you talked about, um, you know, going to the wedding and everything. So that's a vulnerable step to do that. But you also were highlighting all the things you were doing to make sure you have the appropriate boundaries in place that, you know, put you in a place that's safe for you and allows you to show your love. And so there, it's, it's not, a, I'm just going to be vulnerable thing. <laughs> it's, a, um, it's going to, and this is the hard part about it. I think it's, it's like, it's a little bit different with each person we encounter. Mm -hmm. And even in relationships that are more difficult, we can, it seems like there's an opportunity to, to have a closer relationship, but there is a little bit like taking baby steps in some ways, because when there's hurt there or other things that are going on, it's, you know, there's, it's just challenging to navigate them. Absolutely. Yeah, I think everybody's doing a pretty good definition of vulnerability here. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I um, I know there are lots of things we can continue to say. Feel free to, to hang out for a few more minutes and, and chat amongst yourselves. Um, I'm going to make sure that I uh, have the opportunity to commit to the things I said that I achieved um, more service this morning. Um, and this does not have to be the end of our conversations either, right? ACE is intended to be a, a starting point for us to continue to learn and navigate together. Um, so thank you for your vulnerability and your sharing this morning. Thank you all for joining online.